So I'm very pleased that the issues that came up, came up because it, it, as I said, struggling through figuring out how it works is the best way to learn how to do it. Okay, so I just want to give a quick review of uh, what we looked at yesterday so that <clears throat> we all are um, in the same place in terms of what FrameNet annotation practices are, what principles uh, FrameNet uh, uh, implements in, in doing its uh, lexicographic annotation, right? So core frame elements are either present in the sentence or accounted for in some way, with null instantiation being one of the ways that uh, the uh, lack of linguistic realization of a frame element can be accounted for. And null instantiation is uh, one of the big topics for today. Um, generally, we take the approach of syntactic locality, that is, uh, we annotate frame elements within the maximal projection of the target uh, lexical unit. We also uh, annotate full constituents, including prepositions that had prepositional phrases, because after all, the prepositional phrase is part of that constituent. And we looked at uh, this sentence, Vittoria retaliated against her boss for being dismissed by leaving uh, the office keys. Uh, notice that the uh, core frame elements, avenger, offender, injury, <clears throat> and punishment are instantiated in the sentence. They're all present. One of the other core frame elements, uh, injured party, is not, but in this sentence, we know that Vittoria, the Avenger, is the injured party, right? So we're okay with that. We could, in theory, uh, annotate injured party on the second layer, but we don't really need to. We could, but we don't need to, okay? And <clears throat> All of, the cons uh, all of the frame elements are within the maximal projection of the target. They're all on the same uh, structural level, uh, if you will. We looked at second layer uh, annotation. And I just wanted to add a word about the criteria that we use for second layer annotation, <clears throat> which is that <clears throat> the primary criteria criterion is that <clears throat> the frame element that fills the semant the frame element that fills that slot, which we've labeled on the first layer, also provides a uh, information that allows us to make an inference about uh, one of the other roles. So the example, a very clear example uh, here is in the curing frame, in the healing frame, uh, the doctor cured the epileptic, the linguistic structure, the linguistic the purely linguistic material tells us that the epileptic is the patient who the doctor healed, right? Because the noun phrase, the, elep the epileptic, <laughs> sorry, the noun phrase, the epileptic, names a person. So patient is the name of the person. You have doctors, you have patients. Um, but it happens that that term, epileptic, also tells us very clearly that the epilepsy is the, uh, the affliction, the disease, the illness that that patient has. So 
uh, it, 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 it allows us to make, we don't have to imagine anything to say, uh, to, to start with the sentence, the doctor cured the epileptic, to then say uh, epilepsy is a terrible disease, right? It's a natural inference to make. So that's a situation in which uh, we, we are allowed and want to uh, annotate on the second layer. Um, and our avenge example with uh, the alternation, if you will, between um, injured party and injury, right? Uh, Paolo avenged Pedro's death. Pedro's death Pedro. names the injury. But it's very clear from that constituent that Pedro is the injured party. Okay? So we call that situation where you have two pieces of information about uh, the but semantic uh, roles instantiated in one constituent. We call that frame element conflation. Okay? So the criteria is so that the one is constituent so... instantiates two frame elements. And that constituent makes it uh, clear what inferences you can make. Okay? So that's the uh, overriding principle. Now I want to go uh, uh, start looking at special circumstances that come up in annotation uh, and talk about the uh, way that uh, FrameNet handles these special circumstances. The first one, as we started talking about already a little bit yesterday, is null instantiation. And the question is, how does FrameNet handle missing core frame elements? The second more general subject is control. How does FrameNet implement its annotation practices in sentences where the target lexical unit is a complement of some control element? And I use the phrase con uh, control element because we're not only talking about verbs. We're not even only talking about verbs and nouns. We're talking about other kinds of structures uh, as well. OK, so here are some examples of null instantiation. Don't break the window. We won. Alan cooked all week long. And each of these sentences illustrates a different kind of null instantiation. So FrameNet records information about three types of null instantiation. Constructionally null instantiation, definite null instantiation, and indefinite null instantiation. <clears throat> Constructionally null instantiation is when a grammatical construction in which the target lexical unit occurs licenses the omission. And typical types of structures that license constructional, constructionally null omissions are imperative sentences, passive sentences where there's no biphrase, agentless passives, we call them, and independent gerunds and infinitives. That is, there's no explicit subject for that part of the sentence. So let's look at some examples of these from uh, frames that we've already discussed a fair amount, and 
um, I chose these examples because I think it's easier to understand the concept of null instantiation and the different ways in which null instantiation might manifest when you're working with frames uh, with which you're already familiar. So tie the horse to the flagpole with the rope. Julia's broken fingers were taped together. Attaching the map to the wall might ruin the fresh coat of paint. Obviously, these are all examples that we would annotate uh, in the attaching frame. And this is what the annotation would look like. Tie the horse to the flagpole with the rope, where the subject of the sentence is, so to speak, missing. The imperative construction licenses that omission, but FrameNet wants to record that information. Also because we want to know what kinds of um, elements fill what kinds of roles. So what's a typical uh, semantic type of a noun that can fill the agent role in the attaching frame even when it doesn't occur in the surface of the sentence. And that's the agent. That's the, the person doing the attaching. So we mark that on the sentence. And the next slide is going to show you what that looks like in the database, because after all, all not in the database, sorry, in the FrameNet desktop, all, the anno all annotation is done from within the uh, desktop software. The other, the other frame elements are annotated in the usual way that we annotate frame elements, but there's a special way to mark uh, the sentence uh, to say, I know there needs to be uh, an agent frame element here. It's missing because of constructionally null instantiation. And the same is the case for the other examples. Julia's broken fingers were taped together. The agent is missing for because of a constructionally null instantiation, right? This is an example of what we call an agentless passive. There's no, there's no surface realization of that uh, frame element. And in the last sentence, attaching the map to the wall might ruin the fresh coat of paint. We know that someone had to have attached the uh, map to the wall. OK? So uh, in the next slide, I know it's difficult to see, um, but when you get the uh, uh, PDF from the course website, you'll be able to look more closely and see that what we have right next to each frame element uh, label is a pull-down tab that allows the annotator to uh, mark null instantiation. So the annotator pulls down the tab and chooses which kind of null instantiation this frame element uh, illustrates. In our case, um, it's uh, constructionally null instantiation. Okay, any questions about constructionally null instantiation? Uh, Do you want me to go back to the previous slide? Please. Okay. My question is that the agent is not the only uh, core element that is missing here? Correct. So uh, my question <laughs> is, every time I feel that there is a core element that is not 
linguistically uh, realized. realized, I shall uh, mark this as a null instantiation construction. Um, constructionally null instantiation. Correct. Can we go to the further? Um, so, um, I, the next slide, please. When, so, when, when, it, uh, when it comes to the, how do, how do you call that, the, f the frame, frame net um, desktop. desktop, I see that only the, the, the agent is marked as C and I. Well, okay. <laughs> but it's just because of the example. Exactly. Right. But usually uh, yes. we'll have C and I for all the core elements well, that are missing. C only if they're construction they are licensed by constructional no instantiation. instantiation right so and one second let me let me go back to the previous slide again my when i create these slides i try as much as possible to put one piece of new information At on each time. slide rather than overloading you with lots of new information. So, of course, there are other instances of null instantiation in the examples, but the point of this slide is to illustrate constructionally null no. instantiation. Okay, so there's one thing that um, we might do in the process of learning about null instantiation and in the process of uh, learning to annotate. And then there's something else that we do when we're actually a FrameNet lexicographer or a FrameNet Brazil lexicographer, as the case may be, when we actually annotate. And when we actually annotate, of course, we want to annotate uh, accurately and completely, right? I see. So the possibility, there's, but there's another point. So let's go to the uh, picture again. Um, the possibility exists for the annotator to annotate more than one type of null instantiation for a given sentence. Indeed, it's clear that that's going to be necessary just because of the way language is. Things are going to be omitted from sentences that are good illustrations of a particular frame, but don't, you know, all the frame, all the core frame elements are not necessarily going to be there. What's important to know about the way the desktop uh, was de designed and, and developed is the following. Once an annotator chooses a frame element, a core frame element, as um, null instantiated in some way, it's no longer possible to choose the, frame, the same frame element to annotate elsewhere. I see. Right? So, in other words, we designed the software so it locks after you choose that frame element to annotate on the sentence. Do you, do you understand the principle? Yes. And uh, so we can say that non-core elements will never be called as constructionally, constructionally no instantiated. Correct, and that's a good point to bring out. If it's not a core element, we don't need to annotate it. It's the core elements that we must either annotate on some constituent in the sentence or account for in some other way. And today's lecture is really all about what kinds of structures are going to occur at least in English, and I imagine there are similar or analogous kinds of structures in Portuguese where, uh, given the principle of um, maximal uh, projection uh, of the target lexical unit, where are we going to find 
the linguistic material for annotating one of the core elements. Right? We don't need to worry about that for non-core frame elements. Because remember, um, the principle of core versus non-core is that core uniquely defines a frame. Core frame elements uniquely define a frame. If they uniquely define a frame, then we want to know how they surface. And if they don't surface within the maximal projection of the target LU, where are they? Right? We want to match concepts with language. That's, right? That's the, that's the point of uh, mapping semantics and syntax. So if we don't have any surface syntax on which to uh, map the semantics, how do, we, how, do we, how do we explain it? And what do we do in those circumstances? OK? Is, is, that's a lot of complicated material. Is that, is that clear? Questions? OK, let's go on. <clears throat> I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked that. So the, <clears throat> the next kind of uh, null instantiation uh, that FrameNet records is called definite null instantiation. And in contrast to constructionally null instantiation, which has to do with the construction uh, that licenses the omission, definite null instantiation is lexically specific. So you can have definite null instantiation independent of the type of uh, uh, construction in which your target occurs. You can actually have both constructionally null instantiation and definite null instantiation. Right? And I'm trying to keep it simple as we're just learning these things, but if you look in the FrameNet database, uh, you'll see that there are plenty of examples with more than one type of uh, omission. Okay, so definite null instantiation uh, is uh, a situation in which the referent is understood from the discourse or the linguistic context. In other words, either the referent that's now missing was mentioned earlier in the discourse, so not the sentence I'm annotating, but it's clear from this sentence that it had to have been mentioned previously. Or, more generally, the linguistic context provides the information. And I'm going to give you some examples of that. <clears throat> the crucial thing here is that you must know what the missing material is to determine the referent. Okay? It's not sufficient to know um, what category of uh, entity the missing linguistic material is. You need to know exactly what that is or, or really close to what that is. Definite null instantiation is sometimes called um, uh, anaphoric instantiation in the linguistics literature. But in FrameNet, we use definite null instantiation, and we uh, abbreviate it DNI. So let's look at some examples of definite null instantiation. Celia retaliated. Uh, after the bar incident, what uh, is missing? What element? This is from the revenge frame, right? So what element is missing? 
right? Remember the frame elements of the definite null instantiation. Oh, I'm sorry, what did you say? I can't find the offender. Oh, correct, I apologize. I have something, <laughs> I'm already ahead of the game. Right, you can't find the offender, right. You know that there must have been an offender because otherwise, why would Celia retaliate, right? Someone must have uh, done something to harm Celia, right? That is definitional to the revenge frame. Without an offender harming uh, someone, there is nothing to talk about in terms of revenge, right? It, it, it's not possible. Okay, what about, um, uh, Caesar, uh, or Caesar, avenged his brother's death? Somebody else, how about you, with a pink sweater? Sorry, I don't remember your name. Amanda. Amanda. Não tem punição ali. I'm, right. I'm, yeah. Okay. I'm very glad you said that because <laughs> punishment, punishment is actually um, an example of indefinite null instantiation in this frame. Okay. But I'm glad you mentioned it. You had in mind what I had in mind when I uh, responded incorrectly to Monica. <laughs> okay, so um, what's missing here? Exactly, the offender again, right? The offender is missing, right? So, uh, Remember, we have the core frame elements. I should give them in the other order, maybe. Avenger, the person who is doing the revenge. Uh, we have the uh, injury, that is what the harm was. The injured person. Who was harmed? Is there a question, a concern? Yeah. In fact, it's quite uh, quite the same. Uh, Karina was agreeing with Amanda that uh, the punishment is also not there, and I was just explaining to her that it's indefinite. Oh, you, I see. you don't know exactly uh, how or right. what did Cesar did to Evangel. Right. Okay. Yeah. Great. Did you want to ask something? No, I'm glad. I'm glad that came up because there's an important difference between definite null instantiation and indefinite null instantiation. Again, uh, especially in this frame, it's really hard to find examples uh, where, well, I made up these examples, but short, simple examples often have more than one null instantiation, <laughs> right? Uh, in, for this slide, we're looking at uh, um, definite null instantiation. So again, the offender is missing. There are other, uh, other frame elements missing as well, but right now we're focused on definite. Okay, and um, now uh, to speak to something that Monica brought up, uh, let's look at we braved the treacherous waters and docked at midnight. This is an example from the attaching frame. And um, there are at least two missing frame elements under what we call uh, 
definite null instantiation. Only one of them is core. Oh, no, both of them are core. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, you know, they, you guys are really smart. <laughs> connector <laughs> is missing. As it happens, connector in the attaching frame, like uh, punishment in the revenge frame, is, all, is uh, an indefinite null instantiation. Right? We know the category of thing that the... Uh, missing frame element would be, but we don't know specifically what that thing is. Okay, so uh, let me go to the next slide. Um, so we see uh, the first, in the first sentence, Celia retaliated after the bar incident. The missing element is the offender. Um, and, and that's definite null instantiation. In the second sentence, the missing uh, element is also uh, the offender, but it doesn't show up on my slide. I'll add it before you get the PDF. <laughs> and in the last sentence, we have An example in the attaching frame, the item is missing. It's not explicit, but we know it has to be something like a boat, right? The context tells us we braved the treacherous waters and docked at midnight. What else? If, what else are you going to dock, right? You're not going to dock your car in the water, right? And the other uh, missing element is the goal, right? We have item or items, right? Item one, item two, or items. Uh, Juliana, this uh, frame attaching, much like the tourism travel that you were talking about, has the same phenomenon. Item one, item two, items, right, as you were illustrating. So um, that phenomenon, that, pheno that phenomenon is widespread across all kinds of frames. Um, and then we have the goal, right? You have to, you dock your boat somewhere, right? And we know it has to be uh, a dock, or something like a dock, you know, a pier, a, a pole, or whatever. <clears throat> In the early days of uh, working out the attaching frame, we considered calling what we call goal landmark, because it's the landmark where uh, something is attached. But we decided on goal because landmark is also a linguistic term, and we didn't want ourselves to be confused about it, right? That, that, that's as, that is true FrameNet institutional history, which also tells you that when FrameNet lexicographers are defining frames and annotating, we also struggle with what's the best name. And sometimes we choose a name and use it for a while and then decide, uh, that's not really such a great name, let's change it, right? And the, the, the desktop and the editors, some pictures of which you saw, allow us to do that really uh, easily. So, so that's also to say that when you work on FrameNet Brazil and you, you think you don't have the best name, pick a name, use it. And then in the course of doing the work, the corpus search and the annotation, 
something, something better is likely to come to mind that uh, actually captures uh, what you're trying to characterize. Okay, so as long as indefinite null instantiation uh, has already come up, we're going to go right there. Miriam. Yes. May I ask you a question on definite no instantiation before? Yeah. So uh, it's a methodological issue, in fact. Yes. So uh, taking what you just said, I kind of concluded myself that it's not really necessary to have larger context in order to check if the definite no instantiation is indeed anaphoric. Correct. So, Correct. Uh, as I see it, we can inference, you know, Correct. we can infer. Right, uh, that but there has to be something in the language of the sentence you're looking at to allow that inference, mm -hmm. to allow you to understand that it's really there. Correct. Right. And uh, this brings a different issue that, in fact, uh, definite new instantiation may be cataphoric as well, right? Yes, okay, so now you understand why we say definite null instantiation mm -hmm. rather than anaphoric and why I said, okay, uh, in the linguistics literature you might find anaphoric as well. So, okay, all right. Yeah. But the other point is that as with not just linguistic terminology but terminology in general and language, mm -hmm. sometimes the um, uh, most salient uh, member of a category becomes the name of the category. Uh -huh. So I think anaphoric is also a cover term for anaphoric or cataphoric. All right. Right. So. <laughs> okay. Thank yeah. you. I also want you to know that distinguishing between definite null instantiation and indefinite null instantiation is difficult. To this day, when I'm thinking about uh, annotation or frame elements or what's going on with this sentence, I have to step back and say, wait a minute, I actually list the criteria in my head before I decide if it's definite or indefinite and then I go check with somebody else that I got it right. But it's not that easy uh, to hold the differences between definite and indefinite in mind. Constructional is very easy. It's the construction, right? And you have to recognize that it's a constructional phenomenon, but you don't even need to identify your name or talk about the construction. You just need to notice that it's a construction that's uh, licensing the omission. Uh, okay, so let's look at indefinite null instantiation a little more closely. Like definite null instantiation, it's lexically specific. Right? So really, definite null instantiation and indefinite null instantiation are crucial for lexicographic annotation because you want to know you're, you're, anno you're annotating with respect to a lexical unit and it's a particular lexical unit that's going to license the omission and it's different kinds of uh, it's going to be one kind of omission or another definite or indefinite so a um, Typical, uh, a typical category of indefinite null instantiation is um, transitive verbs used intransitively, such as uh, Alan cooked all day for the party. You don't need to know exactly what he cooked, 
You know, however, that he, you know, however, the category of thing that he cooked. You don't need to know that he made roast chicken and, and uh, eggplant. You just need to know that it's food. And the, the word itself gives you that information. It's the lexical item that gives you that information. So you know the category of the omitted entity, which may but need not have been mentioned in the previous discourse. So this is the, uh, the difficult, delicate matter that makes distinguishing between definite null instantiation and indefinite null instantiation so challenging. Indefinite null instantiation, the omitted, the omitted, the omissed, the omission, <laughs> the omission had to be either mentioned in the previous discourse or clearly inferable from the linguistic context. In null instantiate, indefinite null instantiation, it may have been, but it doesn't have to be. That's the crucial difference. Sometimes you have indefinite null instantiation where the omitted entity was mentioned in the previous discourse, but for indefinite null instantiation, it didn't have to be mentioned. So it's, it's exactly that that makes it so difficult to distinguish the two. So let's look at some examples now. from our familiar frames. <clears throat> Marcus avenged his brother's murder. Saul got even with his friend for leaving school early. Raul glued the notice to the fence. What's missing in the first sentence? Amanda? <laughs> Agora é punição mesmo, né? You said it now is the punishment. Can you say punishment? Punishment. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I knew you could do it. <laughs> okay. And the second sentence? Amanda? What's, what's the missing uh, element? Punishment. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> the omission of the frame element punishment is licensed under indefinite null instantiation for every LU in the frame. Every LU in the frame. Because we know that acts of revenge, by definition, include a punishment. Right? If you don't see it in the surface of the sentence, if you don't see it on the surface of the sentence, if there is no linguistic material that uh, illustrates the frame element punishment, indefinite null instantiation. Okay? And um, in the last sentence, Raul glued the notice to the fence. What's missing? Yeah? Excellent. What's your name? 
Okay. Connector. Right. Excellent. So in the same way that um, punishment is always omissible under indefinite null instantiation in the revenge frame, so too the connector is always omissible under indefinite null instantiation in the attaching frame. Do you have a question, Ellie? Not now. Not now? Ooh. Okay. So, what's that? It's kind of promising that later you Okay, can... okay. Um, Medium. Yes? I have a question, so about. Let's go to the next slide so you can see what it looks like. It's yes. About, uh, can't we say that the connector in the third sentence is glue? Okay. Uh, we know as speakers, or as a speaker of the language, I know that the connector is glue, but the word glue does not occur in that sentence. Right? We know that the verb glued includes the information that it's glue that's doing the gluing, right? But there is no linguistic material that um, instantiates that frame element. So the important, the other important thing uh, I should mention here is that Although it's often the case that we know about um, uh, null instantiated uh, elements from the morphological analysis of other words in the sentence, FrameNet does not annotate does not analyze on that level. Now, in other languages, it may be necessary to annotate on that level. So for example, Hebrew, a language I work on, has a very rich morphology, and a lot of the semantics is uh, in the morphology, if you will. So you know about the semantics of the situation because as the linguist analyzing the sentence, it's in the morphology of the word, the predicate, the, the noun, whatever. So when my dream of Hebrew frame net is realized, I will have to think carefully about how I want to and whether I can, uh, from a computational perspective and all kinds of other logistical issues, uh, incorporate morphological analysis into the frame semantic annotation, right? Well, that is not what FrameNet does. Uh, I was questioning because of the previous example about the uh, we docked for the night? Yes, okay. So, so the difference between the indefinite no instantiation and definite no instantiation kind of is a little blur to me now. Because uh, we docked for, for the night, I think that was the yes. example, and Raul glued the notice. I feel that I can... Ah, the difference is... Um, doc... Uh, requires some kind of both, whereas um, this, the, okay, see how easy it is to get confused? <laughs> Uh, 
dock requires some kind of boat to be the item. The dock to, uh, to be the And landmark. the dock to be the goal. The goal. Right? Um, but glue, we, we don't know something specific about the... Con this is very subtle. It's not necessarily glue. I it can glue with right. for super tape, for instance. Yeah, you, it would be a little weird in English to say that, but you can attach something with a variety of entities. It doesn't matter what the entity is. Uh -huh. you, you just know that there's some entity that's connected. I see. Right? That's the concept. So it's, it's a little subtle. It's much, it's quite subtle. subtle. It's quite subtle. You just witnessed confusion that having to dis when you're trying to distinguish between definite and indefinite. It's quite subtle. Um, and um, takes a long time to grasp. That's all I can say. I think now would be a perfect place to take a break. Let's say